John Gartner here, and welcome to my sake education video series. Today, I want to talk about namazake, or unpasteurized sake. Actually, what I really want to talk about is the pasteurization process itself, what it is, how it's done, why it's done, and how it can affect sake, and then unpasteurized sake, or namazake, and its variations, and of course, compare that to pasteurized sake. To start, most sake is pasteurized. In fact, most sake is pasteurized twice. Once after the brewing process has been completed and on the way to the storage tank, and then a second time after the typically six month storage period and on the way to the bottle. How is it pasteurized? By heating it in one of a handful of ways, which we'll talk about, to between 60 and 65 degrees C, which is about 150 F or so, for usually a very short time, and sometimes an instantaneously short time. Why? To stabilize the sake, to prevent it from going bad. More specifically, pasteurization deactivates enzymes that would feed a type of lactic bacteria that ruins the sake when it proliferates. Once those two things have been accomplished, in other words, once the enzymes have been deactivated and the bad lactic bacteria has been killed off, the sake can be safely stored at room temperature without fear of it getting very, very weird or even undrinkable. We might as well get this out of the way too. Unpasteurized sake or namazake must be kept refrigerated or its chances of going bad are very high. Not guaranteed, mind you, if no bad lactic bacteria got into the sake. In other words, if the brewery is kept very clean and free of those, then it would not go bad. But it's impossible to know that for sure. So why take a chance? Keep your nama cold. If you remember anything from this video, remember that. So, what's the point? Why all the fuss? Well, not surprisingly, pasteurization can strip a sake of character. It can, if not done properly, rob a sake of its youth, its liveliness, or its brashness. But remember, it grants the sake stability, and in the opinion of some, it gives clarity and depth of expression in exchange for that loss of liveliness. Especially in comparison to most pasteurized sake, nama is much more lively. Some people feel that namazake is sweeter, although chemically that isn't true. Uh, many people say they smell and taste cut wood, fresh, fruitiness, liveliness, and brashness. Most people find it appealing for sure. And it is indeed all of these things. However, if not cared for, at first namazaki will get cheesy, yeasty, and bursting with a flaw of a chemical called isovaloraldehyde. If you think that word's a mouthful, wait till you taste it in your sake. Also, pasteurized sake is much more stable, unencumbered by the distinctive or often idiosyncratic aromas and flavors of nama. Nama's popular, many like it quite a bit, and it's far less common due to the obvious storage and handling challenges. And we all want more of what is rare, so namazake can be trendy and very well promoted. So, one more time, namazake is unpasteurized sake, and most sake is actually pasteurized twice. And there are variations on the pasteurization process and a handful of pesky terms that comes with them. In particular, either one of the usual two pasteurizations can in fact be skipped, and there are terms for these variations. Why would they do that? Why would they skip one or the other of the pasteurizations? to retain some of the original youth and liveliness of the sake while still providing it with some stability. That's why. So, usually, the first pasteurization takes place after the sake has been brewed and the rice dregs filtered away. The brewers will then pasteurize it on the way to the storage tank where it will spend the next six months or so. However, provided they keep the sake cold from the time it is pressed to the time it gets into the storage tank, they can skip this pasteurization. The sake will then be stored and pasteurized once when it leaves the storage tank and on the way to the bottle. And because it has been pasteurized, it will be stable. Skipping the first of the two pasteurizations is known as nama chozo, which means stored as nama. Alternatively, they can skip the second of two pasteurizations. In other words, the sake will be pasteurized once on the way to the storage tank, and then when it goes from the storage tank to the bottle, they'll skip that second pasteurization, just being extra careful to make sure that the sake is not exposed to the open air so that no lactic bacteria can fall in. When they skip the second of the two pasteurizations, that's known as namazume, or bottled without pasteurization. 
In truth, the difference between skipping the first pasteurization, namachozo, and skipping the second pasteurization, namazume, is a little bit gimmicky. Doing either one will retain a little bit more youth and liveliness in the sake, and the choice of which pasteurization to omit is really something that varies from brewer to brewer. And just to make things interesting, namazume, or skipping the second pasteurization, can also be called hia oroshi when it is released in the fall. In other words, hia oroshi is a seasonal sake released usually in early September or so that's technically the same thing as namazume. And if that's the case, again, what's the point? Why complicate things with more terminology? Because the tradition is there and the historical anecdote is there as well. Hia Oroshi is a very old term that was used hundreds of years ago. Back in the day, when things got cold enough in the fall, the brewers didn't need to pasteurize a second time because it was cold outside, and that would maintain the quality and stabilization of the sake. So Hia Oroshi refers to sake that was released once it got cold outside, and therefore eliminating the need for that second pasteurization. But, as I pointed out, technically it's the same thing as Namazume, and the second pasteurization is skipped. Of course, all of this begs the question, why is it even necessary to pasteurize twice? In other words, if you've pasteurized once, it should be good enough. You shouldn't need to pasteurize a second time because you should have killed off the lactic bacteria and deactivated any enzymes that would feed that lactic bacteria. So why do they do it twice? The short answer is just to be sure. Just to make sure that nothing bad can happen to the sake. The long answer is that the practice of doing it twice developed long ago when Ginjo was not around. In other words, sake back then was sturdier, less delicate, less light, and for sure less aromatic. Furthermore, the priority back then, when the government was much more involved with dictating these things, was stability. The government wanted to make sure that the potential tax revenue did not go to waste, and so they insisted that brewers pasteurize twice. Certainly, the tax revenue potential of sake is still important, However, technology and awareness of the issues have changed to the point where rarely does sake actually go bad inside of a brewery. So yes, namachozo and namazume both should be fine without refrigeration. So let's get back to the actual methods. Sake can be pasteurized and pasteurized very powerfully, very strongly, and you'll certainly have a lot of stability when you do it that way, but you will strip the sake of some character. Or, sake can be pasteurized very delicately, just enough to deactivate the enzymes and to kill off the bad lactic bacteria. And, as we mentioned, pasteurization will exact a price. But it can be done in such a way that that price is well, well worth it. In short, when it comes to pasteurization, usually less is more. How is it actually done? Most commonly, sake is pasteurized by running it through a coil that's immersed in a small tank of hot water. This heats it up to about 60 to 65 degrees C, and then it's cooled off on the way to the storage tank. For the second pasteurization, very typically sake is heated en route to the bottle, and then pumped into the bottle while hot. Then they'll cap it, and that creates a little vacuum inside the bottle once the sake cools down. But there are countless other ways. Sometimes bottled sake is run under a hot shower, and then subsequently a cold shower to heat the sake up and then cool it down fairly quickly. And in fact, there's actually heat exchangers that are used at some breweries where the sake is heated up instantaneously to pasteurizing levels and then cooled down just as quickly to room temperature again. Many believe this allows the most youth and liveliness to remain in the sake, although such equipment is somewhat expensive. And there are actually some brewers that believe the sake should be heated up slowly rather than quickly and will heat it up very gently in troughs and then cool it down just as gently. One brewery I've been to actually uses conveyor belts inside of troughs of hot water so that the sake gets put into the trough and the speed of the conveyor belt is adjusted to make sure the sake spends just the right amount of time in the hot water before being cooled down. Not surprisingly, there's lots of attention to detail that goes into the pasteurization step, and just how it's done will vary hugely from brewer to brewer. Another consideration is the timing of the pasteurization, just how soon after the brood sack is completed is it pasteurized, and how soon after storage is it pasteurized. And if there's only one pasteurization, just when is that pasteurization performed? 
This is all important because maturation, how quickly a sake matures, is hugely affected by when it's pasteurized. In other words, namazake matures much more quickly than unpasteurized sake. So if you want to allow maturation to proceed at a fairly quick pace, store it as nama. If you want maturation to slow down because perhaps you won't be shipping the sake for a while, then pasteurize it sooner because the sake will mature at a much more mellow pace. None of these options are intrinsically better than another. It's just a matter of what style of sake a producer wants to make and how the timing of the pasteurization and the methods of pasteurization can help them attain this. And that all leads to another important point. Namazake is not unequivocally better than its pasteurized counterpart. That's important, so I'll accept the liberty of saying that again. Namazake is not intrinsically or unequivocally better than pasteurized sake. It's just different. As I mentioned earlier, namazake tends to be more lively, tends to be more expressive. However, very often that expressiveness, that liveliness, that typical nama flavor and aroma can act like a veil and kind of mask or hide the true nature of a sake. And in truth, I actually tend to prefer pasteurized sake more often than namazake. But let me hasten to add that properly cared for namazake can be outstanding for what it is. So in the end, neither one is better than the other, at least not unequivocally. Like everything else, it's just a matter of what you like and what you enjoy. Next, as mentioned earlier, if not kept refrigerated, there's a high probability that namazake will go bad. However, this bad is actually a progression. In other words, it's not fine one day and completely undrinkable the next. Unpasteurized sake can begin a long, slow, painful descent. And, in fact, that liveliness, that woodiness, can, in fact, be appealing to a lot of people. So, in truth, the unique flavors and aromas of namazake are actually quite enjoyable to a lot of people. However, if namazake is not cared for properly, if it's not kept refrigerated, in time it gets to be really cheesy and actually kind of annoying and not enjoyable at all. That condition is known as namahine, which just means it's off because it's nama. So namahine is namazake that started to go south. And again, namahine is appealing to some people and to others it isn't so much. As I mentioned, I tend to like pasteurized sake better, so even the slightest namahine is a put-off to me, but not to everybody. It just depends on what you like. However, if the namahine condition is allowed to persist and develop even further, it becomes what's known as hiochi. A sake in the hiochi condition is simply undrinkable. You can tell a sake is hiochi at a glance because it will have a white cloudiness inside of it that looks different. It kind of floats in the middle uh, as opposed to something like nigori sake where the white cloudiness settles at the bottom. So look for that white murk floating in the liquid and also if you have the chance to smell it, it will be very, very yeasty and overwhelmingly full of aldehydes. So to wrap this discussion on namazake up, Unpasteurized sake can be lively, can be youthful, can be extremely enjoyable, but it's not unequivocally better than its pasteurized counterparts. Remember that the various variations on namazake, where one of the typically two pasteurizations has been skipped, can be extremely enjoyable as well, as often these varieties have a bit more liveliness retained in them. And lastly, keep your namazake cold and enjoy it relatively soon. I hope you enjoyed this short presentation on namazake, and if you're interested in more sake education videos, by all means, please feel free to subscribe. And remember, any sake education activity always goes a little bit better with a glass of sake at hand. Kampai.